So again, the idea of epigenetics, as I'm going to be talking about it, is simply looking at epigenetics as the vehicle by which an environmental exposure like a drug changes gene expression. I'm not talking about transgenerational inheritance. Why don't we talk about that at the very end of my lecture? I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about the epigenetics that's going on in your brains as we speak, okay? As a reflection of, as both a reflection of changes in gene expression and I hope to uh, uh, convince you, a mechanism by which those changes occur. So now focusing on this level of analysis, this what we call the nucleosome. We now <coughs> know a nucleosome is comprised of four histone proteins, two copies each of H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. The way the nucleosomes are oriented is such that their N-terminal tails face outward from the nucleosome as shown in the cartoon here. It's really, and when you look at the crystal structure of a nucleosome, it really is an amazing particle of life because it really looks almost like this. You have a core of proteins, the DNA double helix wrapped around, almost two turns around the nucleosome, and the N-terminal tails facing outward. And we now know through work by a large number of laboratories that these N-terminal tails are chemically modified, post-translationally modified by, uh, in many ways. Uh, David Allis, who's a colleague at Rockefeller University, has coined some hokey terms, but I actually think they're quite useful. Uh, he calls them writers and erasers. So the enzymes that basically produce these modifications are the writers. The enzymes that uh, take them away, remove them, are called erasers. Okay? And we now know that histones are modified in many, many ways. This shows now histone H3, the globular portion, the N-terminal tail, and shows only a small subset of the amino acids in the N-terminal tail of H3, which are chemically modified. For example, uh, by um, phosphorylation, protein kinases would be a writer, protein phosphatases would be an eraser. Uh, acetylation, where histone acetyltransferases are writers, HDAX histone deacetylases are the erasers. Many sites undergoing acetylation. And by far the most diverse form of covalent modification is methylation of lysine or arginine residues on histone tails. I'm only showing the lysine residues here where different enzyme machinery, different writers, different erasers are involved in controlling the methylation state of e every single one of these methylated lysine residues. Okay? So for example, what, we, what you'll hear me talk about is H3K4 methylation, so that's lysine 4 methylation which is controlled by histone methyltransferases, histone demethylases, specific for K4. I'll also talk a lot about, uh, and this is uh, a different color because when this occurs, it's generally associated with gene activation. When lysine 9, in contrast, is methylated by a whole different set of enzymatic machinery, it's mainly repressive for gene expression. Lysine 27 is another major site of repressive methylation. Deeper in getting to the core of the histone protein, there are additional sites of histone methylation more associated with uh, activation or, uh, or of, of transcription or, or um, ongoing transcriptional activity. Putting together this kind of a scheme, which shows the spectrum, two ends of a broad spectrum of chromin and state between an area that's active where gene expression is occurring and an area that's inactive where gene expression is not occurring uh, because the nucleosomes are condensed to such a degree that they don't have access to the uh, nearby DNA. So what happens, according to the party line view, is that a transcription factor, in our case, delta Fos B or Kreb, would bind only to those spans of DNA that are already in some kind of a permissive state. It would be hard for them to bind here because the DNA is too bound up, too repressed. That's why delta Fos B wouldn't induce a liver gene in a brain cell. Um, they would bind to their response elements in DNA and then recruit co-activators. Co-activators might include the HATs, which ac acetylate these histone tails. Other forms of, ha uh, of co-activators would be called chromin and remodeling proteins, examples of which are the swi sniff proteins. Chromin and remodelers are ATPase-containing protein complexes. 
that provide the molecular motor to move a nucleosome along a strand of DNA while that strand of DNA is being transcribed into RNA. <coughs> and then all told, and then there are some examples of histone methylation like H3K4, uh, which are pro-activation as well. And all told, eventually uh, the basal transcription complex containing RNA polymerase II is recruited to the gene to mediate transcription. In simpler systems, mainly yeast and stem cells, when people have studied this, about 200 proteins can be recruited to a single gene promoter in concert with activation of that gene. It's amazing. Okay? We, uh, it's hard, no one has known what occurs in brain, although our data suggests very similar types of patterns, as one might expect. In contrast, in repressed chromatin, you see a very different state of chromatin where the nucleosomes are packed tightly together, mediated through repressors. And repressors would be HDACs, which remove the acetyl groups, certain forms of histone methyl transferases that add methyl groups to amino acid residues that are repressive, and then DNA methyl transferases that methylate DNA itself. The approach that my lab has taken, and we've been working on this for, um, yeah. Sure. Uh, I've been reading somewhere and I came along to express many genes, about half of the genes of the genome. Yeah. So does this mean that half of the genome is then packed in the neuron? Is this physically possible? Yeah, this, that's a great question. That was that's the that's the number that I've seen as well, that roughly half of all genes are expressed in the brain. But I think <coughs> what that doesn't take into consideration is the cellular heterogeneity of brain tissue so that it's likely that any given nerve cell type or glial cell type is not expressing half of the genome and rather is expressing a much smaller subset. Um, there's no evidence that the state of chromatin is more um, permissive, expanded, less repressed in nerve cells than it is in other tissues. We've been at this now probably for about seven or eight years, so I'll, what I'll give you today is a progress report. Uh, the approach we've taken is a series of genome-wide assays, all focused on nucleus accumbens, to understand how chronic administration of cocaine or other drugs is altering the epigenome uh, of, of, uh, of the tissue. We would start out with genome-wide assessments of changes in gene expression, for example, identifying by use of DNA microarrays. More recently, we're using RNA-seq simply stands for RNA sequence. You isolate RNA from a tissue, uh, do a single strand uh, transcription into DNA, sequence the DNA. It's much more complete, much more quantitative. You also capture microRNAs and non-coding RNAs, which are missed by DNA microarrays. So, for example, with respect to genes, we can identify a subset of genes whose mRNAs are induced in nucleus accumbens after chronic cocaine. Oh, I should also say, when we started out, we s totally used the simplest system available to us, which was injecting a mouse se once daily for seven days with cocaine and looking 24 hours later. There's no way we could have been doing this on self-administration tissue. I, Dion, how many mice do you think we've used on this over? I mean, it, the amount of uh, work it took just to figure out how to use these tools made it impossible to do this on self-administration tissue. And then we would overlay on top of these, uh, this gene expression information, genome-wide information on the state of chromatin. We would start out using CHIP-CHIP and more recently CHIP-C. So it, the first CHIP in both cases stands for chromatin immunoprecipitation. Take a tissue, you lightly fix it to cross-link uh, the DNA to nearby proteins, histones and other proteins, fragment the DNA, and immunoprecipitate it with an antibody, say to an acetylated histone, delta FOS B, or whatever. In the um, immunoprecipitate, then, is only those segments of the DNA, of the, of the genome, that were bound by that protein in vivo. And we can, uh, in the case of a chip, analyze the DNA by looking, using a promoter chip. Okay, that's a chip that would be spotted only with promoter regions of all genes. Or, more recently, with sequencing, which is far more complete, because we know a lot of the chromatin Regulation occurs not in promoter regions, but throughout genes and outside of genes as well. So, for example, for a gene that's induced in nucleus accumbens by cocaine, we'd expect that to be associated with an increase in some permissive adaptations or a decrease in some 
repressive adaptations for both. And then we would overlay that with chips, chip or chip seek for transcription factors of interest. Uh, I say that this is a progress report and I mean it very seriously. If you take one dose of cocaine, one time point, one brain region, and analyze everything that's listed on this slide, it's about a terabyte of sequencing data. Okay. So we are drowning in data and a lot of what we do is to working hard to understand how to optimally mine it. So what I'll tell you today is, is, a, is really very much a progress report. Now I think it's still the right approach to take because um, first from a technical experimental point of view, any of you who've done microarray or RNA-seq experiments know that the replicability, even within the same lab, from experiment to experiment, is pretty bad. Uh, if you look across the literature and compare gene lists that people have gotten from the use of Illumina or Affymetric gene expression microarrays, same cocaine paradigm, same brain region, the overlap might be 10%. So that's pretty bad. Our hypothesis is that by overlaying these different uh, data sets and perhaps allowing a bit more false, ne false positive discovery in each set, but overlapping them to limit false negative discovery, we can obtain a gene list in which we'd have greater confidence. And of course, at the same time, inherent in the data is a vast amount of information of the mechanisms underlying that gene's regulation. Okay. So one of the first things that the field found, and this is going back about eight years ago now, is that when you give an animal cocaine, or an animal takes cocaine itself, there are global increases in many of these chromatin marks. Totally surprising for the field. That's taking, taking a nucleus accumbens and by Western blot or, or immunohistochemistry, looking at levels of acetylated histones. Not looking at gene-specific effects. And there, this list sh gives you examples of some of the genome-wide changes that people have found. There's, after chronic cocaine, there's clearly an increase in histone acetylation. We think it's more respect, respected for H3 than H4, but both have been reported. Uh, we think part of that is mediated through regulation of specific HDACs. Uh, Ian Mays in the lab showed that there's a decrease in the form of repressive histone lysine methylation, which I'll be talking about a lot in the, in the remaining uh, minutes. Specifically, H3, K9, ME2, and ME3. I, sh I should test you on my code. Do you all know what I mean by that now? So that means like dimethylation of lysine 9 of histone H3, okay? <coughs> and we think that that downregulation is mediated through repression of the enzyme G9A that catalyzes that particular mark. So G9A is an H3K9ME2 histone methyltransferase. And interestingly, there's no change in other major sites of methylation. There's also changes in DNA methylation. And there are two forms of DNA methylation. And has anybody talked about this this week? So there's 5-methylcytosine. That's the traditional form of methylating cytosine nucleotides in a strand of DNA. More recently, Nat Heinz and others have shown that there's a chemical modification to 5-methylcytosine, from 5-methylcytosine to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, perhaps en route to demethylation of that cytosine. And what uh, folks in the lab, Quincy LaPlante, more recently John Fang in the lab, have shown is downregulation of this DNA methyltransferase that, catalyze, that catalyzes 5-methylcytosine and a TET1 protein, this is a DNA repair enzyme, that is important in converting 5-methylcytosine to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. And we know that many other types of adaptations occur as well at a global level. Uh, one of Deanne's project, I don't know if you had a chance to uh, talk about that, but Deanne has done beautiful work showing cocaine regulation of uh, arginine methylation of histone proteins. And Kim Scobie in the lab has also demonstrated cocaine-induced changes in poly-AD pararibosylation of histone proteins. Um, and um, Hao Shang Sun in the lab has demonstrated a role for many chromatin remodeling proteins like those SNF factors and related family members. 
And what's interesting is if you step back from all this work is that in each case, the change that chronic cocaine has been shown to induce would be expected to be permissive for gene expression. It's interesting because that's not the case in our chronic stress models. We've also seen a whole series of global changes, but they don't all fit either pro-depression or anti-depression. Okay? But in, with cocaine, they're all in the same direction. So that's just a, uh, a, an observation. For example, increase in histone acetylation, decrease in repressive histone methylation, a decrease in uh, ph uh, methyl uh, cytosine, and so on, all would be expected to be permissive for gene expression. And before I get into gene-specific phenomena, I'd like to tell you about a brief uh, finding that Ian Mays made with Jian Feng uh, on one particular global histone modification, which provides perhaps some insight into how cocaine through the regulation of these global effects, not gene-specific, but global effects, are reorganizing the genome within nucleus cumbens nerve cells. Okay, so here's an example where um, Ian found a um, decrease in levels <coughs> of this repressive histone mark, H3K9ME3, trimethylation lysine 9 of H3. It's a rather dramatic decrease after chronic cocaine administration. Also occurs with, chronic, with cocaine self-administration, by the way. And it's been, it was particularly surprising because, as I'll show you, H3K9ME3 is thought of as a marker of heterochromatin. Heterochromatin is that highly inhibited, condensed, silent chromatin. Okay? So why would cocaine be producing a change in silent, at, at this mark in silent chromatin unrelated to genes? Right? It's kind of it's weird. But what, what Ian found is that indeed it does seem to be occurring using other markers of heterochromatin, for example, HP1, which stands for heterochromatin protein 1. Ian was able to show by immunohistochemistry a reduction in the uh, intensity of staining of nucleus accumbens medium spiny neurons uh, in this mark. And I should say this is occurring in nucleus accumbens medium spiny neurons, not in dorsal striatum, and for example, other parts of the brain. So we know it's neuronal. It's not glial, and we know it's selective for nucleus accumbens. And one of the ideas that we had was that since heterochromatin is the tightly compacted portion of uh, the genome, that if the amount of heterochromatin decreased, then the amount of opened or permissive chromatin would increase. And associated with that might be a change in nuclear volume. That's been seen during development or in cell culture as cells differentiate. The size of their nucleus actually increases and decreases. But it's only been shown in cell culture or developmental models. But lo and behold, here's an adult mouse treated chronically with cocaine, and there's an actual increase in its nuclear volume selected for medium spiny neurons in nucleus accumbens. And then using ChIP-seq, we can get some insight into what this type of regulation might mean. What's shown, and what's shown in the pie charts is the uh, distribution of this H3K9ME3 mark across the genome. So you see here are genes, gene deserts, means they don't have genes, and other intergenic regions, meaning other DNA may be regulatory, but no coding genes present. And you can see, as people had shown in peripheral tissues, basically, um, cultured cells and stem cells, that there is a predominance of this mark outside of genes. And the distribution is not altered by cocaine. And if you look at specific areas of the genome that show a cocaine-induced decrease uh, in this mark, we found the most profound uh, decreases in what are called repetitive elements. Repetitive elements are regions of the genome that do not express genes, do not encode genes, but some of them e express what are called retrotransposons. Have you guys heard of that? So these are segments of, of genes that are expressed into RNAs, and the RNAs can then be reincorporated into other sites of the genome where they can disrupt functions of, of genes. And what we predicted is that, in fact, um, as a basis of decreasing the binding so we predicted by CHIP-seq a decrease in binding <coughs> of this repressive mark at repetitive elements. We then looked at several specific repetitive elements from our 
ChIP-seq data. We're able to validate most of them. Most of them show a decrease, cocaine-induced decrease in this repressive mark, although a couple show an increase, interestingly enough. And actually, we've, we found the similar, if this repressive mark is, um, is decreased, we'd expect an increased expression of these repetitive elements, and in fact, we found that by PCR. So why, this really is an interesting story because it indicates that cocaine, through this global change in a repressive mark, is inducing the expression of retrotransposons in nucleus accumbens, the possibility of which means that some of these retrotransposons, once expressed, are then reinserting into the genome and producing uh, bad changes. And in fact, we now have direct evidence, work done by John Fang, that in fact what cocaine is doing is inducing the incorporation of these repetitive elements into new sites in the genome, leading in some cases to the expression of abnormal mRNAs. So ab an abnormal mRNA would be a mRNA from a gene, and all of a sudden seeing a repetitive element stuck in somewhere uh, in that gene, disrupting the ability of that mRNA to be expressed into protein. So it really emphasizes the profound nature of, of how the genome is regulated in an adult animal, not during development, and including by a stimulus like cocaine. Mary? Yeah. Would we, see cocaine we, uh, we have no idea. So we have not looked at that yet. Yeah. Okay, so now back to gene-specific effects. And I've summarized on this slide a shitload of data, all of which is unpublished, um, that the lab has put together, Dion and others have contributed to it, um, and trying to get a sense of what genes show regulation. What I'm showing in this slide, particular slide, for the purposes of this lecture, using delta Fos B as an anchor, although by no means are we only interested in delta Fos B. So what, we're, what I'm showing here, and I want to thank our head bioinformatics guy, Lee Shen, uh, just to give you an indication of how hard it is to analyze these data. Lee, Lee is an, a faculty member, and he has two people working in his lab, so that's three people full time on this sequencing data. Like I learned math on a slide roll. I have no idea what, right? Okay, so, um, so what we have found is the following. So we, we find a set of genes, chip-seq, chip-chip, chip-seq. We find a set of genes that show a cocaine-induced binding of delta Fos B at somewhere in those genes. And then we ask, to what extent is that change in delta Fos B binding associated with changes in a lot of other chromatin modifications? So that's color-coded here. And I'm showing now a partial list of all the histone and other endpoints that we've looked at genome-wide to date. So here are a couple of examples of histone acetylation, a few examples of histone methylation, RNA polymerase II, CERT1, which is a type of histone deacetylase, and this is the 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine. And you can see that there are certain um, changes in histones that are associated with, the, with a... Um, an increase in these histone changes associated with an increase in delta Fos B binding or a decrease in these various chromatin changes associated with an increase in delta Fos B binding. And then we can ask how that relates to changes in gene expression. And by far the most common signature associated with increased gene expression is depicted here, not surprisingly, an increase in histone acetylation, an increase in this activational mark, a decrease in this repressive mark binding a POL2, but delta Fos B binding is not only associated with an induction of gene expression, about a third of the genes are, are, show a decrease in gene expression. And when delta Fos B binding is associated with a decrease in gene expression, we see a different signature, an increase in this repressive mark, and reduction in POL2. What's shown here is a series of plots using a novel software platform that Lee and his colleagues developed called NGS Plot. Do you know what NGS stands for? maybe next generation sequencing, yeah, um, that basically shows the distribution of various marks across genes genome-wide, starting at the transcription start site, the transcription end site, gene body, and then uh, regulatory regions 5' prime and 3'. Prime. And the patterns make sense, that there are certain marks like histone acetylation and this H3K4 methylation, highly enriched at promoters, other marks like uh, H3K36 
trimethylation builds through the gene body. That mark is important in elongation of transcription. And still other marks um, like this H3K9ME2 that I'm going to be talking about a lot shows a very uh, uniform pattern across all genes. It's not promoter enriched despite the fact that it seems to be very important in controlling levels of gene expression. Finally, what we found is that although many genes show an enrichment of delta Fos B binding, after all, you know, we see a uh, two to three fold inc induction of delta Fos B in nucleus cummins neurons, it's not surprising that there are hundreds of genes that show an increase in delta Fos B binding. A smaller subset actually show a decrease in delta Fos B binding, which I think highlights some of the complexities of chromatin regulation that I'll get back to. And one of the advantages of the chromatin analyses that I, talked, that I haven't talked about yet is that the identification of these chromatin signatures makes it possible not only to understand mechanisms of changes in steady state gene expression, but also genes that are scarred, genes whose levels of expression are normal, but are somehow scarred at the chromatin level, so when they're next, next given cocaine or another stimulus, they respond abnormally. And an example of some of that regulation is shown in this slide. This is some older gene expression work done by Ian Mays and Quincy LaPlante using uh, Illumina arrays with three experimental conditions, giving an animal a single dose of cocaine looking an hour later, a group of animals chronic cocaine, followed by a challenge looking an hour later, a group of animals given chronic cocaine, a week of withdrawal, and then the acute challenge. And you can see 100 or so genes that are induced in nucleus accumbens after a single dose of cocaine, several of which are no longer induced after chronic exposure. So those would be genes that are desensitized by cocaine. Even more striking are the genes that are not induced acutely, but that are induced in animals that are pretreated with cocaine. In other words, these genes have been sensitized to be induced in response to a cocaine challenge. And some of that is long-lived or long meaning a week. And using these types of uh, chip seq data, driving then quantitative chip, which is simply looking now at a specific gene and you looking at a lot of other adaptations, a lot of other markers at those genes, we can begin to put together stories of what patterns of chromatin regulation occur when a gene binds delta Fos B is an induced or another gene that binds delta Fos B and is repressed in response to chronic cocaine. Uh, remember I mentioned at the outset that in yeast and stem cells, there may be 200 or so genes recruited to induce or repress a gene. We've only, we're at about a dozen so far, so we have a long way to go to get a full picture of what's happening. But here's an example. So CDK5, cyclin-dependent kinase 5, um, is a gene that we're interested in because we think it regulates some dendritic growth, which I'll get to in just a couple minutes. Uh, this is induced by uh, cocaine through delta Fos B, so we know that delta Fos B binds to an AP1 site in the CDK5 gene promoter. That is associated with the recruitment of a certain type of histone acetyl transferase called CBP, Krebs binding protein. It binds one type of SWI-SNF protein called BRG1, PAL2, other proteins, and so on. It's associated with increased acetylation, at the vicinity of the CDK5 promoter and an increase in this activational uh, methylation site. Now, interestingly, there's also a decrease in levels of this repressive histone methylation site, which we think is also mediated by delta Fos B because delta Fos B represses G9A. So in other words, one of the genes that's regulated by delta Fos B is G9A itself, this histone methyl transferase that catalyzes this repressive mark further leading to the further induction of the CDK5 gene. Now an example of a gene that's repressed by cocaine through delta Fos B is CFOS. So here, when delta Fos B binds to an AP1 site, instead of recruiting activators, it recruits, recruits uh, repressors. Repressors would include certain types of HDACs. Here are two shown here. And in this case, even though total cellular levels of G9A are reduced, the CFOS gene shows an increased binding of G9A and increased levels of this repressive mark. Again, highlighting the complexity of chromatin regulation. Even though global levels are down at certain genes, levels go up. 
So a couple of questions raised by these data. First of all, we need to understand why it is that Delta Phos B can, when it binds to one AP1 site, it recruits activators, where when it binds to another AP1 site, it binds repressors. We have looked, are looking genome-wide, we don't see an obvious uh, solution to that question, su suggesting that it's, those differences are due to pre-existing chromatin changes already present at those genes. And the second point is that all the data that I've shown you this far is correlational, right? It's not causal. So how can we provide a level of causal information? Uh, well, we can use our genetic tools as a start. So Arvind Kumar, some years ago, took our lines of mice where we can turn on delta Fos B only in D1 type uh, neurons and then look in nucleus accumbens using quantitative chip at the CDK5 promoter showing that after a chronic cocaine administration, there's the selective acetylation of H3, not at H4, recruitment of BRG1, not of another family member, Rec uh, an increase in this activation mark of histone methylation and a decrease in this repressive mark. And we can show in other animals that have never been exposed to cocaine, simply turning on delta Fos B is sufficient to replicate that pattern of chromatin regulation providing some causal evidence that indeed delta Fos B can trigger some of these subsequent events. Now, what, what might be obvious is that there is this um, reciprocal relationship between levels of this repressive mechanism and delta Fos B. And what I have alluded to already is that delta Fos B and G9A can each negatively regulate the other. I've already mentioned that delta Fos B represses G9A gene expression. And conversely, we've shown in several systems that a binding, levels of binding of this repressive mark to the Fos B gene is inversely correlated with delta Fos B expression, as, as might be expected. Now, how can we provide causal connections between these two proteins? Well, what we've done is, for example, we can overexpress G9A only in nucleus accumbens. We can knock it out solely from nucleus accumbens neurons, showing reciprocal regulation of delta Fos B. But the problem is that when we manipulate an enzyme like G9A, we're affecting H3K9ME2 binding, not only at the Fos B gene, but at hundreds of other genes. And the question is, is it possible to target to come up with a better level of proof. Can we experimentally target a single type of chromatin modification to a single gene in nucleus cummins neurons in vivo? And we think we can. So this is uh, recent work done by Liz Heller in the lab where she's taken what are called zinc finger proteins. Zinc fingers are moieties that are used by many transcription factors. And it's possible to prepare synthetic zinc fingers in the laboratory. What Liz did in collaborating with Sigma, which has proprietary information to predict type, types of zinc fingers that might bind to a particular gene, is what Liz did was to take 64 synthetic zinc finger proteins and analyze them for their ability to regulate Fos B expression in cell culture. It turned out that the ability of a zinc finger to regulate the Fos B gene in cell culture had no relationship to what happened in brain, so we quick, quickly abandoned all cell culture work. So instead what Liz did was to take a series of zinc fingers, and you can imagine the amount of work this entails, about 20 zinc fingers, link them, make a fusion protein essentially between a zinc finger and P65, P65 is a subunit of the NF-kappa B transcription factor that promotes recruitment of histone acetyltransferases and activates gene expression. Alternatively, she took the zinc fingers and fused them to G9A, the catalytic moiety of G9A, this histone methyltransferase. So now she has a zinc finger protein, all DNA, not protein. She has the zinc finger protein linked to either P65 or P50 incorporated each one of those into a different herpes vector with the help of our friend and colleague Rachel Nevy, without whom we could not do any of this work. Rachel's at MIT. 
And then Liz proceeded to overexpress each of these proteins independently in vivo. And she found several zinc fingers when coupled to these functional domains produce the expected result. Some of the data are shown here. So here's a zinc finger protein, one particular zinc finger protein that's coupled in one case to um, P65 and another case to GNINA. And we can show that when the zinc finger is coupled to P65, it activates the FOSB gene and induces FOSB, delta FOSB mRNA in nucleus accumbens. When the same zinc finger is fused to GNINA, we see repression. We believe that this is due to chromatin mechanisms because we can show that these changes are associated with an increase in histone acetylation in this case and an increase in H3K9ME2 in this case. The latter is shown in this panel where we can show that this zinc finger coupled with G9A induces H3K9ME2 binding at FOSB but not at a couple of other genes. And in fact, what Liz is doing now is carrying out CHIP-seq on cells that are overexpressing this zinc finger G9A to demonstrate that the zinc finger is binding only to FOSB and inducing this H3K9 selectively at FOSB. A question. Sure. How dependent was the efficiency of these fusion proteins on the linker? We're talking about 100 proteins. You mean the effect of the zinc, presence of the zinc finger on the catalytic activity of the, uh, of the enzyme, of the G9A? Well, in terms of the full change that you would get, you said she screened multiple constructs for each. It's, it's multifactorial, and we didn't care because we took a path of least resistance so that we were looking for zinc fingers when coupled accordingly produced robust reproducible effects on expression that would be in the right, pr correct predicted direction. Right? And then we've taken now a handful of these zinc fingers and try to understand or prove that they're acting the way we think they're acting through their catalytic moieties. Well, it's horrible. Yeah. yeah. The, the other technology that's available would be tail technology, transcription activation-like effectors, I think they're called. And, uh, and we all have similar evidence using tails coupled to P65 and G9A of the same kind of phenomenon. The attractiveness of tails is the ability to dial in the sequence of the protein based on the sequence of the nucleotide to which you want it to bind which is very nice, uh, whereas with the zinc fingers, you have this huge step of empirical uh, surveys of suites of proteins for their biological activity. And, and using the zinc fingers, Liz has been able to demonstrate the predicted behavioral effects. I'll just give you one example here. We can now suppress, delta fo suppress FOSB gene activity through the zinc finger G9A construct and shows that it reduces the behavioral responses to cocaine. So we're very excited about these data because for the first time, it, it enables us theoretically to go to, into an animal and say, okay, I want to see, I've been talking about this H3K9ME2 at FOSB being important. I can now experimentally turn on that modification, I think, we think, only at FOSB and see what subsequent downstream events that trigger. So in terms of mechanisms of chromatin biology in, in neurons, we think this is very important. All right, so in the remaining uh, 10 or so minutes, let me now, as promised, turn back to function and discuss the ways in which we're attempting to take these massive gene lists that we're generating and use them to understand something novel about addiction biology. And one of the analyses that Lee did on our delta FOSB chip seq data, so this is analyzing where endogenous delta FOSB is a binding and plotting the relationships of those genes in a gene network analysis, you can see the predominance of synaptic proteins as among delta FOSB targets. And it was that kind of data that caused us several years ago to consider the hypothesis that perhaps delta FOSB is an important mediator of something you've heard about from Peter and presumably several other people this week, the, this ability of stimulant drugs of abuse to induce the growth 
of dendritic outgrowth of nucleus cummins medium spiny neurons. So shown here is several of the proteins uh, that uh, delta Fos B binds directly to from our genome-wide data. And the hypothesis is, is cocaine regulation of delta Fos B and some of these downstream targets required for the ability of cocaine to regulate the actin cytoskeleton and dendritic <coughs> growth? The answer is clearly yes. This is a recent uh, study done by A.J. Robeson in the lab using a, a novel experimental approach that enabled us to distinguish D1 and D2 type medium spiny neurons in nucleus accumbens. He used a herpes virus with a uh, uh, flux a stop sequence prior to the expression either of delta Fos B or a dominant negative antagonist delta June D and injected these viruses into D1 Cre and D2 Cre mice. So we can target delta Fos B or delta June D expression to either D1 or D2 neurons. And what AJ found is, as many people have replicated over the years, a course of chronic cocaine administration does increase dendritic spine density and affects specific to immature spines. And I'll come back to that toward the end of the talk no effect on more mature mushroom-shaped spines. Delta Fos B overexpression was able to mimic that effect of cocaine. The effects were not additive. And overexpression of Delta June D completely blocked the ability of cocaine to regulate dendritic spine growth of D1 nerve cells, of immature spines on D1-type neurons. No effect seen on D2 neurons. This is a nice approach in the sense, this is, I, I should say this work, this approach in general was pioneered by Scott Russo when he was in my lab in that it utilizes a fluorescent protein that's also expressed by the vectors uh, that really uh, visualizes the spines very, very nicely. We think it's far superior to Golgi staining. It's at least as good as dialistic staining. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Peter was looking at width. That's right. Um, I think that's probably better to go ask at the end. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, because what I'm going to do is highlight, how, despite all the data that's been published, how little we know. But before I am so nihilistic, I'm going to make believe we know a lot more. So among the genes that show these patterns of regulation, by delta Fos B and all the histone modifications that I've been discussing are a series of GTPase regulatory proteins, so-called guaninucleotide exchange factors, which excite G proteins, and uh, GTPase activating proteins, which decrease the activity of G proteins. And what we found is a series of uh, GEFs and GAPs for small GTPases that are regulated in a way that would be predicted to downregulate the function of these small G proteins, in particular one small G protein that I'll be talking about called RAC1. Now importantly, total levels of expression of RAC1 are not affected by cocaine, nor is the activity of RAC1 affected by cocaine in a sustained manner. Rather, what this is work done by David Dietz in the lab, what David found is that prior chronic cocaine exposure makes the cell able to adapt to a subsequent cocaine challenge with a very transient decrease in RAC1 activity only, which we feel is poised by transcriptional regulation of these proteins. But what signal connects a cocaine challenge to the activity of these proteins remains unknown. A decrease in RAC1 would be expected through several steps to increase the activity of the actin severing protein cofilin, and perhaps by increasing actin severing, making spines more plastic, increase uh, the numbers of immature spines, thin spines, stubby spines, and so on. So David tested this hypothesis in several ways. First, he made a series of herpes vectors expressing different forms of proteins and studied their effect on spine density and nucleus accumbens. Uh, he uh, showed that a control vector, again, cocaine induces uh, thin spines, uh, 
If he overexpressed a constitutively active form of RAC1, he blocked that effect. If he overexpressed the dominant negative antagonist of RAC1, he mimicked the effect. And downregulation of RAC1 would lead to an increase in cofillin. So if he overexpressed a constitutively active form of cofillin, he also mimicked that effect. He was able to show the similar type of data using a different model. So instead of overexpressing dominant negative RAC1, he knocked out RAC1 selectively from <coughs> nucleus cumbens of adult animals using viral Cree injection into the nucleus cumbens of flocks, RAC1 mice, and again showed an increase in spines. Now there was something inherently unsatisfying about this experiment because what these vectors do is produce sustained changes in RAC1 levels over days. But that's, and that's, as I mentioned, that's not what cocaine does. Cocaine produces, after a while, produces pulsatile decreases in RAC1 activity. So what we did was to take an optogenetic approach, only not optogenetics in terms of channel rhodopsin. We uh, obtained a vector expressing a photoactivatable form of RAC1, so where light is controlling RAC1 activity. I think it was the first example of actually controlling an intracellular protein optogenetically. And what we can do is to take this RAC1 photoactivatable, unstimulated, no light, RAC1 photoactivatable stimulated with light, but the light is only given 15 minutes during cocaine exposure. So we only induce RAC1 activity during the precise time where we showed a cocaine challenge normally decreases RAC1 activity. And we were able, or uh, a, a stimulated additional mutant where a point mutant in this photoactivatable RAC1 makes it unable to be uh, <laughs> photoactivated. And what we found is that simply controlling RAC1 activity in these nerve cells in this pulsatile way completely blocked the ability of cocaine to produce the, the, that growth in dendritic spines. And we carried out a series of behavioral experiments that correlated very nicely with this biochemistry and spine morphology. So that um, condition place preference, I'm sorry, repeated exposure to cocaine causes a condition place preference that was completely blocked only when RAC1 was turned on in concert with each cocaine exposure, and whereas a whole series of control experiments did not affect cocaine action. That's talking about spine morphology. What about functional plasticity? So in parallel to this study, we collaborated with Brad Gruder, who's at Vanderbilt, and he was then in Rob Malenka's lab, work done also with A.J. Robeson in my lab, where we used some of these same vectors that targeted delta Fos B selectively to D1 or D2 nerve cells. And what we were able to show is a rather robust decrease in AMPA to NMDA ratios when delta Fos B is overexpressed in D1 cells, not in D2 cells. And using a physiological measure called coefficient of variance, essentially it's looking at the variability of data in the AMPA current and the variability of data in the NMDA current, a ratio of which is taken as physi by physiologists as a reflection of the number of silent synapses, although that's a very, very indirect measure. Right? Silent synapses, thinking back to Peter's talk, are those synapses that exist but don't have a lot of AMPA receptors in them. So they're silent. You don't see them physiologically. Suggesting that what delta Fos B is doing is inducing silent synapses. Perhaps delta Fos B does the opposite in D2 nerve cells. So the hypothesis here is that delta Fos B is orchestrating a um, program of gene expression that... Uh, controls the formation of silent synapses. That's the hypothesis. So the idea here is that within this spine, single dendritic spine, there's the actin cytoskeleton that underlies the shape and size of the spine, and biochemically the activity of a series of RAC1, uh, of, of RAC1 GTPase controlling cofillin uh, governing the uh, shape of that spine. And what the data I've shown you is that delta Fos B through the regulation of various GEFs and GAPs and poising RAC1 for repeated uh, suppression of activity and induction of 
coprophyllin activity leads to the induction of more immature thin spines. What I haven't shown you is delta Fos B regulates many other proteins at the glutamate synapse, for example, the GLUA2 amper receptor subunit, which would further be associated with the formation of s smaller amper responses and silent synapses. Now, so what are the problems and limitations with these data? Anybody have any idea how many small GTPases are expressed in nerve cells? Dozens. RAC1 is one of dozens. And in fact, we know that several are regulated by cocaine. So we focused, no, problem number one, we're focusing on RAC1 for no good reason. Well, it came out of some of our bioinformatic data, but the bioinformatic data also show others as being robustly regulated. What are some other weaknesses? We have no idea whether this is occurring in D1 or D2 cells. We do not now have the capability to study a molecular intervention on spine growth at a D1 and D2 specific manner. We're working on developing the technology that would make that possible. We, we don't have that, did not have that at the time this came out. Okay, so we don't know D1, D2. Any other possibilities? Well, there, yeah, okay. This is all done with seven daily doses of cocaine. This is what I call the dumbass approach to drug abuse, which my lab proudly embraces. Seven doses of cocaine looking 24 hours later, okay? So we have no idea what happens. Peter was talking about the importance of that three-week period of withdrawal. We have no idea what's happening during that time. And, and we have no idea what's happening in drug self-administration models. So that's a highlight of some of the, of the weaknesses. And then the one question that you raised, Chris, is what happens to the, um, the size of the postsynaptic density, uh, which would require EM analysis really to do that correctly. Uh, at, so the experiment to do would be to take animals, a mouse that's self-administering cocaine. You have to use mice because you need the genetic tools made available in mouse. How many laboratories do mouse self-administration? Do you have any idea? Maybe five. Okay. We're going to need a shitload of mice that self-administer cocaine to do this, but that's okay. Take, m get mice to self-administer cocaine, analyze them at, right after th they come out of the self-administering boxes, maybe an hour later, a day later, a week later, a month later, okay? So lots of time points. Do this in genetically modified animals that enable us to look specifically at D1 and D2 nerve cells and use a whole sort of viral tools that will probe these different uh, proteins and their function in that state. Personally, I think that that's what needs to be done in the field. We're going to try to take that on. But uh, you know, you, I want to indicate, so as you look at the literature, if you ever are inclined to, at spine regulation by cocaine, you're going to see data that don't make any sense. But if you look in detail, everybody is looking at a different time after cocaine, a different type of administration paradigm, controlling or not controlling for D1 cells, controlling or not controlling from NA uh, nucleus cummins core versus shell, and so on. Okay? Okay. So then finally, and this is my last data slide, is the um, need to relate this morphology, plas the structural plasticity and the functional plasticity back to behavior. So this is the type of an experiment that, we're, that we and others uh, are gearing up to do, people like Anto Banshi, Christian Lucher, Garrett Stuber, and, and many others now. Uh, this is not the <coughs> slide I meant. This is one experiment done by Rose Bagan in the lab where she has used optogenetics, now the more traditional form of optogenetics, using channel rhodopsin overexpressed in glutamate re regions of brain that provide excitatory input to nucleus accumbens. So for example, in this experiment, I'm showing you uh, mice that have been injected either into the medial prefrontal cortex or the ventral subiculum with uh, channel rhodopsin. We then wait a few weeks in order for the channel rhodopsin to be transported to the nerve terminals in the nucleus accumbens and shine light into the nucleus accumbens. So now we can selectively control glutamatergic 
the activity of glutamatergic inputs from a, in a site-specific manner. And what Rose did was to apply an LTD-like stimulation of these glutamatergic afferents, essentially one hertz stimulation for a period of several minutes, which suppresses the activity, the endogenous activity of those terminals. And what Rose found is that when we, when she, we meaning she, selectively silenced the glutamatergic inputs to the nucleus accumbens from the ventral subiculum, she found an enhancement of place conditioning, enhancement of responses to natural rewards, no effect on baseline locomotor behavior. Whereas when she did carried out the same uh, manipulation on glutamatergic inputs from the medial prefrontal cortex, she had no effect on these behaviors. Stimulation of the me suppression, silencing of the medial prefrontal cortex input seems to suppress lo cocaine-induced locomotor activity, whatever that means. So this is interesting, and I think this is the type of optogenetic experiment that people in the drug abuse field now need to do. There's one additional detail that's not on this slide. You guys know what I'm, what I'm referring to? So we can now selectively look at a glutamate input from ventral subiculum, say, coming into nucleus accumbens shell at core. But we can't differentiate whether the inputs are uh, synapsing with D1 or D2 nerve cells. And that's the other piece of information that's absolutely essential because there are probably large differences. And somehow I think that over the next five years, this ty these types of approaches will begin to parse the types of structural functional plasticity that are related to behavioral plasticity uh, at the level of the nucleus accumbens. So it's a very difficult, time-consuming work. So to conclude, I hope I've convinced you that, the, that we can learn a great deal by focusing on regulation of gene expression, chromatin biology. We're certainly uh, identifying lots of proteins. Um, one of our, I was telling Chris that one of the reviewers of our recent grant submission said that we're catching a lot of fish. This is a fishing expedition and we're catching a lot of fish. And somehow that was a criticism. Um, I actually am a big, f I'm actually a big proponent of open-ended discovery research. I think hypothesis-driven research is kind of stupid because if you know enough to make a hypothesis and you prove the hypothesis, fine, but you already knew it enough to make the hypothesis. So what we need more of is open-ended uh, research. And everything that I've talked about today pretty much is the basis of just open-ended fishing. Um, Don't throw that in your grants. <laughs> oh yes, in every single one of my grants, I emphasize the hypothesis that we are testing. Okay. Uh, everything I've talked about today is just for nucleus accumbens. I think we need to do the same exact levels of analysis in all the other relevant brain areas. Here's an interesting point that I think it will be impossible to get funded but I think is absolutely essential for the field. We all in our laboratories focus, uh, re reduce our experimental systems to the most carefully controlled conditions <coughs> possible. I've shown you a lot of data of what happens, just for example, when you overexpress or knock out delta Fos B in, an, in a D1 cell, or if you overexpress CREB in a D1 cell. But we know a lot of D1 cells express both activated CREB and delta Fos B at the same time. What happens when both of those somewhat opposing signals are occurring coincidentally in the same nerve cell. It means we have to create uh, experimental systems that are far more complicated than we've done thus far. Actually, William is one of the few people I know who've, t who's taken it on to create experimental systems that are that complicated, involving three and four transgenes at once. Imagine the pain of doing that. What, is, what three, one out of 64? <laughs> Right. And these are the kind of tools that we're going to need to use in order to answer the kinds of specific questions that we've been raising. Okay, and then finally is this last mark, which we all include in every one of our grants and on which uh, none of us have made any progress <laughs> over a quarter of a century. And I, am ex I come before you today with great humility that we have failed. 
So my generation has failed. It's all on your generation now. Get over it. Because <laughs> the sole reason why NIH, appro why Congress appropriates money to NIH is to improve the public health of the country. That's what NIH means. And cardiovascular illness, you guys are too young to remember back when I was your age, when cardio men used to drop dead daily at age 50 from cardiovascular illness. Cardiovascular illness has been transformed in my lifetime. It is amazing. Right? We are now beginning to see the same kind of transformation in cancers, rheumatologic illness, and so on. Treatments of psychiatric illness? <coughs> all right, Really bad. No different in 50... People get mad at me when I say this, but basically no different today than 50 years ago. So something has to happen. We need to think of why it is that we failed so that you guys can do better. So anyway, I'll stop there, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And with a picture of my hometown. <laughs> so I like this picture because this is Central Park. This is Mount Sinai. This is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Do you see that orange colored building there? That's where I live. <laughs> okay. So, so, Dr. Crosby, is it definitely through the dopamine D1 activation? Do you know that? Yes, because we can demonstrate a blockade of delta phosphate B induction with giving a D1 antagonist. Okay. So, so dopamine is released on the reversing signal as well. Yes. So, and do you get delta phosphate? Yes. So, in um, several chronic stress paradigms, we've seen an induction of delta phosphate B, as you'd expect, and that occurs um, selectively in D1 type nerve cells but it only occurs in mice that are resilient to stress. It does not occur in mice that are not resilient to stress. And so we think that delta phosphate B is induced in response to stress, but there's more of an individual variability involved. And those animals that show that response are inherently more resilient. They're more resistant to the bad effects of stress. Now why it is what is the inherent difference in those animals and in their D1 nerve cells or other circuits that explain that difference? I, we, we don't know yet. I was just going to ask, my memory molecules tonight, do you have delta plus B that can mark it with regulating chloride too? Yes. Okay. Um, was that speculative or is it new? No, we published several papers showing that when delta plus B is induced in D1 nerve cells, we can... We, uh, the effect is to induce the glue A2 subunit. So again, that is interesting in terms of affecting the stoichiometry of AMPA receptors in nucleus cummins D1 type neurons, probably related to the issue of spine head size, silent synapses, and so on, but exactly uh, how and creating those specific links remains unknown. the gap between that and behavior, some people are running the LTP and LTD experiments, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if in your behavioral or in your cocaine administration paradigm, and if you see any changes in that sense, or what, what's the function of these spine changes, you think, in your hands, and then are there also changes in, say, FI curves, input-output, intrinsic excitability, which you alluded to at the right. beginning, right. and obviously you want to know that in a pathway-specific manner. And right. Input. So I would say that is a body of work that needs to be done. Lots of labs have reported LTD or LTP-like effects of cocaine at nucleus accumbens synapses. But again, if you look at the whole literature, it's very messy. Right. Some people report a more LTD-like effect, others an LTP-like effect. And I think the variables are exactly the ones we've been talking about. People look different times after the last dose of cocaine. People don't differentiate between D1 and D2 cells or between even specific glutamatergic inputs to those cells. And there's a little bit of data coming out from Lucher's lab and um, Bonchi's lab, although interestingly the two labs disagree, that perhaps some of that synaptic plasticity is likely specific to one input pathway or another. 
Yeah. To go along with this. What, so we, really what I think needs to be done is to overlay all the analyses. Right? So just as I said, so you have a mouse self-administering cocaine at a specified time after the last dose, understanding what's happening to the transcriptome epigenome in a given cell type, what's happening to the synapses formed by that cell type with respect to specific inputs coming into different sections of the nerve cell, and then what's happening functionally at, at a sets of spines. Right? That's, I think, what needs to be done. Whether one lab can do that or not, I don't know. I don't think so. That's the thing. In, ter in terms of what's practical, yeah. because what you've done is like a ton of effort, right? And we can't take those molecular changes and extrapolate them to the cocaine treatment that everybody else is doing exactly. necessarily. So we kind of have to pick a regimen and, and make it uniform, at least. I agree. I agree. So that's something that NIDA can do. NIDA can specify, listen, after you've developed methods the kinds of functional experiments should be done with mice to self-administer cocaine. I've actually now bought into that. I think that that's fair. And we should aside to you, we should decide to use one type of mouse because you know you can also do this in 10 different genetic strains. So let's just pick C57 mice and choose a standard self-administration paradigm and to make things a little more rote. All the gene expression data we get are put on the web so they're generally available. So you know all these tools are or these resources are available to everybody. But people using the same regimen would help a lot. I think so. Yeah. But which one? Right. I'm sorry? <laughs> which one? Yeah. Well, that's the, oh my gosh. <laughs> I haven't even gotten into some of these. I saw it up there earlier. <coughs> yeah. Which, which, addiction, <laughs> which addiction model? Right, so which relapse, which reinstatement model? Yeah. I'll put you and Trevor and Barry, and Calivus, and Koob, <laughs> and Banchi in the same room. And then I'll tape it for fun. Chris and I, <laughs> Chris and I will be in the next room having a beer. <laughs> no, so I mean, that's, that, that's the point, right? It's, I don't get into fights I don't need to. That's one I don't get into because, you know, you guys tell me what to do. No, that's why I think Yes. You know what? I would welcome something like that. I think it would make my life simpler, and I think it would make every lab's life simpler. Yeah. And then teach people how to develop the models, because that's yeah. one of the other issues, is even doing the, the same model in different labs. But you, you know, Chris, Absolutely, that's bring, true. Bring what these no, guys do is, is this is a lot of training as well. The point is that it's no more difficult to do self administration in mice than, than actually creating this kind of highly compute, actually computational based model. Right. Right. It just that's a tool like another. Yeah. No. 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 I'm saying it's. it's uh, I'm saying if you if you're asking for everybody to use these models, you've got to train them how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it's and it's the same as using these these yeah. analytics. Yeah. Honestly, optogenetics, it's spread in two years. IV self-administration in mice. It's been IV in rats has been there since 1962. And there aren't that many rats. So, so, so David, so do you do self-administration in mice? I did. You do? Actually, I went yeah. to Griffith's lab. And okay, I good. I did it there, there are so few labs that do that. Right. And they would do nothing else, so then you have to make a choice, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. So, are you going to transform your lab in a self administration lab? Right. Or are you going to keep on having integrated approaches or removal practice? Mm -hmm. So, that was a yeah. strategic decision. It's still demanding, right? I, I, it is doable, <laughs> but very demanding. Ask, ask, ask Eric, it's been two years I'm producing rats, not even mice. To address the question we design together. Right. Two years. Yeah. And we do that every day, seven days a week. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, I mean, some of the self-administration paradigms themselves are so long lived, you know, take a long time, months for the same rat or mouse. It almost becomes a clinical study. <laughs> I mean, that's the problem in clinical studies where you, you know, study 20 humans and somebody has a problem and drop out of the study, you've lost an amazing investment. But I've seen the same thing happen in self-administration labs where you have a rat that has all this extensive behavioral experience, something happens to it, now you've lost a research subject. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. So I, I really like the kind of a, you know, system biology approach, like you know, to do identify new hypothesis. I mean, just look at some of the approach, like you know, for example, the psychiatric disease, like what Dan was doing with autism, mm -hmm. human brain. Mm -hmm. You know, I can, can kind of tease out some kind of network out of, of those kinds of situations. I wonder, have you, think, or are you doing some of the experiment with an addicted, you know, post-mortem brain? And yes. And try to see the network level, maybe there's some kind of overlap. Yes, so that is something that we've done as an effort to try to make more progress in understanding and treating human addiction. We've now embarked on rather large studies on human addicts and carrying out the same kind of genome-wide studies uh, on human addicts. The challenge is even greater than for mice. So for example, for mice, if we wanted to do RNA-seq on two simple conditions, control, cocaine addicted, right? That's not so bad. We take 20 or so mice that are self-administering cocaine at one time point. We'd pool nucleus accumbens tissue from six or seven mice and have a, a triplicate analysis, okay? Now you take 20 human cocaine addicts you can't pull the tissue. Every person is different with their own personal history. So you really need to do RNA-seq on every single human. And we know from clinical studies that an N of 20 is nothing. So that about $1,000 a pop per RNA-seq. So you can figure out the math, and that's one brain area. So you get a sense of what's involved. I think that's what we have to do, but it's, you know, the obstacles are quite large. Well, the, RNA, yep. <laughs> the only thing worse than doing it would be doing it on tissue where the RNA isn't good, isn't right? Yeah, because yeah. then, you know. But is it, there's degrades, is there degrades of good as well. Yeah, so you're doing it. You know, the experiment I talk to people in my lab about is take a group of mice, kill them in every different way, leave them on your bench for different amounts of time, and then the next day cut out their brains and study them. Right? That's what human postmortem tissue is. Not very pretty. Thank you very much. So